You're listening to Unpaused, a podcast for women who want to stage a career comeback or mastermind a new one after an extended break from work. I'm your host, Judy Stewart, and if you want to reclaim your career but don't know how, then this is the podcast for you. Let's meet our guest for today. Bryony Fitzgerald, prominent Sydney interior designer, is part of Australian decorating royalty. Her mother, Anne Gingell, was one of Sydney's foremost decorators and designers in the 1980s, and Bryony learnt at her mother's knee, drinking in her trademark use of bold colour and her exquisite taste. Bryony has parlayed that knowledge into the distinctive, striking colour combinations for which she's renowned beautiful textures of gorgeous textiles and her own love and deep knowledge of contemporary art. One of her most famous commissions in recent times was the work she did with her sister, London chef Sky Gingell, in bringing a space in Somerset House to life as the celebrated restaurant Spring. Terence Conran called Spring the most beautiful dining room in London, no small accolade for a woman working at the other end of the world in Darlinghurst in Sydney's Inner East. Bryony began her career as a fashion designer and managed to fit a successful marriage and family life into a hectic professional schedule. However, the leaps she took into her professional future have been highly considered and it's only now in her 50s that she's felt confident enough to document her body of work and show it to the world. This professional reboot came at the same time that she bought a former restaurant and brothel and converted it into the studio she'd always dreamed of, a place from which to run her business and nurture her creative team on her own terms. I think the thing about this place for me was like a a new kickstart. I'd been in the same place for nine years and to actually move into something that was mine, that was completely set up, to be exactly how I want that I think that I can spend the next 10 or 12 years to the end of my career, I know I can do it here. Listen for Bryony's advice about putting a value on your time and how confidence boosting it was to finally document her body of work. There's no meteoric rise. It's literally, I got married, I had children, and I started working literally two afternoons a week when Isabella was a baby for sanity. I had a babysitter, and I worked at Porter's Paints, and I mixed paint. That's where I learned how to, all about paint. And I also worked for my mother. She was an interior designer in, in Sydney for 40 years. And she also worked with Marion Horbest, who's probably Australia's most famous interior designer. Mum worked with her, then I worked for Mum and then she retired and then I started doing my own work. But my business literally started when I I could work when I had babysitters because my husband was in the film industry. He was away probably three or four months of the year over most of our marriage. And so I literally worked when I could. Started with just doing interior and exterior paint scheme. Then they both went to school and I started working nine till three. And I did that nine to three thing till almost till they were midway through high school. And was that in your own business or was that working for someone else? No, my own business has been since they were born. Isabella's 27, so it's got to be 26 years old. Also, because originally when I left school, I got thrown out of school when I was 16 because my father caught me jigging school so many times he didn't want to pay the school fees anymore. They used to catch me walking up William Street from Skeg to Darlinghurst. And he threw me, he said, I'm not paying for you to go to an expensive school. And I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? I had no intention of going back and doing my HSC, but I went and did dress design, fashion. That's what I was interested in. And that's where I got my passion for textiles because I started pattern making, sewing, tailoring, doing fine needlework. I completely learned how to sew, which I think has probably been a fantastic foundation to my understanding of how textiles behave. And I was a dress designer. I worked for lots of other people doing design. I designed children's wear for a company when my kids were little, as well as doing a bit of interior design. And then designing the children's wear sort of dissipated as my business started to take off, I suppose, or I started to make a living from it. So it's literally taken 26 years to get to this point, just purely because of where I was in my family life. 
I know it must have been incredibly hard to really be a single parent a third of the year but on the other hand sometimes I used to think when I was working at Fever Pitch I used to think oh I'd like to be Rapunzel at the top of the tower where I could just go and be left to get on with it for a few days instead of having to stop start cook dinner think about all that admin I think it did me a great service not a disservice I think it might have been hard at times but it made me very independent and very capable. You get very capable of looking after your children. I got capable of working. I got capable of running a house because you have to. But I suppose in the other sense, I did always know that I had a husband and I always knew that he would come home and he was also a great father when he was there and picked up a lot of slack. So I don't, I'm don't. i not bitter about it in any way. And I'm sure half the reason I'm still married is because he has been away for about 10 or 15 years of our marriage. I know that from having had some professional interaction with you that you are very interested in textiles and, and what works and what doesn't work and what looks beautiful together and the juxtaposition of different textures and colours. You take in a lot of things but also, Bryony, you know a lot about art and not just Australian art. I really like your eye for art. So those three things, the textures, the art and the colour, all come together really naturally for you, but it's something that you've obviously built up over a whole lifetime of work and different roles. I think it's intuitive. I think I've learnt it from my mother. Sky would probably say the same thing. Sky and I always think the way that she sets up a plate of food is how we set up a room with the colours and the textures and the layers. And it's really funny because we've had quite a lot of discussions about how something looks and there's an incredible similarities. For example, when I did spring, I found this Moroccan pillowcase, a woven cushion cover. And it had every single colour that's in Sky's restaurant. I took it to England with me and I said, Sky, that's the palette of the restaurant. And she looked at me and said, I've got it. They had pale blues and torps and pinks and creams and browns and the, the torpy browns were the casino cab chairs and the pale blues the grass cloth. It all took place, but the palette was there. I think from doing fashion, that's when I got a real understanding for textiles and how to sew and how to cut fabric. And it's completely intuitive for me. But it's interesting that you and Sky, so just to explain your sister Sky Ginjal is a very famous cook with a very beautiful restaurant called Spring in London, which Briony, you designed. It's in Somerset House. And as you know, I love the restaurant. I love Sky. I love her food. I love, I love everything about it. I love the artwork in that restaurant too. You know, those beautiful ceramic flowers on the grass paper. Ceramic blossoms that are actually rolled out like pastry and then fired for 48 hours at over a thousand degrees with tiny little magnets on and then they're connected to the wall on the back of nails which come in and out of different heights so it undulates in and out. But see, that's all about texture. I mean, the interesting thing about those walls at spring was they were so vast. What are we going to put on them? And art would have looked terrible. I mean, painting within a frame would have looked absolutely terrible. It needed something that sprawled out. And I think that all goes back to that spatial awareness. That is what it's all about. That's where you start when you design, is how something fits into space. I'm interested in the fact that you're so true to yourself. You are doing what you were meant to do. All of these layers have built up over the years to make you very qualified to do what you do so well and what you obviously so enjoy. So, Bryony, talk to me about the building you're in, because I think that that in itself has been a project for you personally as well as professionally, and how you were able to identify that property and make it what it has been. When I first started work, I worked from home. So I had, and it was at my father's house, and we had this big dining room, and I used it as my office. And then Dad died, and we moved to a smaller house, and I had to find an office. So I found my very, very first office, which was actually with a carpet company, and I was upstairs in Surrey Hills. And then I always had this dream, this vision of this beautiful, big, white studio. And the first one I got was the one that you probably came to in Bondi Junction. And I was there for nine years, 
And at When We Knew, it was absolutely a beautiful space, but I rented it for nine years. And then it got to the time where I knew that I had to buy something. It took me four years to find this place. And I always had this vision that it had to be on a corner. It had to have its own front door, its own presence. And so I just kept looking. We looked and went to loads of auctions. And then eventually we were driving past this building one day, Jeremy and I, and it, and it had a, um, an auction sign on it. And the strange thing is my father and mother had taken me to this building for dinner because it was a restaurant called Shayol's, which was the beginning of Nouvelle Cuisine in about 1978 when I was about 17. Guy and I, you know, the whole beginning of that food movement. I remember Jeremy, my husband, saying to me, he said, oh, that's a terrible building. I said, no, I've got a feeling that the floor plan is going to work absolutely perfectly. So we eventually got access, had a look at it. But I mean, it was derelict, Brian. It had been between Shayol's and Brian Fitzgerald. It went through a few dark days. It was absolutely hideous. I put a limit on the money. We went to the auction. I really didn't think we'd, we'd get it. And it was just one of those times that it just was exactly meant to be. It was I, the auctioneer, I'd done his house up. It was just a weird set of circumstances. I knew him quite well. And we said that we couldn't spend one more cent and we got it for exactly the amount that we sent. It just was mm. meant to be. And then we moved in in March last year. I think the thing about this place for me was like a, a new kickstart. I'd been in the same place for nine years and to actually move into something that was mine, that was completely set up to be exactly how I wanted. I think that I can spend the next 10 or 12 years to the end of my career. I know I can do it here. Something that strikes me all the time is that when a man retires, the first thing they do is get an office in town. But a woman, what does she do? A woman works off the dining room table for as long as she can until the day when someone says, look, I really need to eat off this table. You need to get out. And then you go and find a space inside someone else's space. And then you might go and rent something. And then finally, in your late 40s, 50s, you sort of think, well, actually, I really want a place of my own that I can call my own and I want to leave my mark on it. I want to make it work for me. You're in the business of doing things up. You must see women working off the dining room table all the time. It's what we all do. Absolutely. There is something I love that this is my my space. This is my yeah. place to create. I love coming here. You know, I honestly, I thank God every day that I have a beautiful home and I have a beautiful place to work. I treat them as equally. I treat them as my two homes. This is my day home and that's my night home. can you look back and say that you had one really big breakthrough and my second part of that question is do you think it was luck or do you think that you engineered it without realizing I think it's a combination I would be very misguided if I didn't say who my family was didn't make a difference because a the mum was a very successful interior designer in Sydney and also because of who dad so was. just explain think, about your father Bryony my father was born in Melbourne you know came to live in Sydney and basically became friends with the Packers and ended up being the first man on television in Australia in 1956 he went ladies and gentlemen welcome to television which nobody young would remember but when we were small he was one of the most famous people in this country and I actually hated it and I found his success very uncomfortable because of that connection I know it really did aid in the type of work and the type of clientele that I got quite early on. I went to school in the eastern suburbs. That has been a huge contributing factor to the clientele that I have. But on the other hand, I wouldn't be still doing it if I didn't have the skills to be able to yes, do it. Yes, that'll take you so far. So got, it got me into a client base probably much sooner. I remember a lot of people said to me, why did you change your name? Like, why didn't you just call yourself Brian Kinjo Interiors? I just couldn't do that. There was part of me that really wanted to do it on my own merit. Yeah. So being Fitzgerald design I suppose there was a combination but I also had the access to who he was I suppose the most significant most public project I ever did was Sky's restaurant but that was only four years ago and it was very important to me that job a for my relationship with my sister and b it was an extraordinary project I'll work on and I do think it's probably one of the most beautiful things I've ever done but it was also because Sky let me or let us together create something so beautiful. The only restrictions we really had was from was a grade one listed building and we had a lot of issues with English councils and heritage listings and all of that stuff that went with Somerset House. But it was an absolutely beautiful job 
and I'm very, very proud of it. But beforehand, it was all mainly high-end residential and it was all word of mouth because we don't do publicity. I don't photograph that many of our work. Redid the new website sort of a year ago. Which is beautiful, Bryony. That took at least 10 years to get a body of work that I thought was good enough to photograph and have as a website. It takes such a long time to build that up in this business. It's not like making fashion or even cooking that you can make something quickly. I have to wait for the people to let me do my job properly. I can't do it by myself. It's a very good point that it takes a long time to build up and document a body of work where you are really the creative and driving force behind it. There are a lot of other moving parts to a body of work. I mean, in your particular profession, you've got to have the right clientele, they've got to have the right resources. It all takes a long time. Most of them take two to three years to build. If you start from scratch, it takes a long, long time. It really, really does. It's like I've been waiting. It's moving into this building, getting the new website. But I feel like I've sort of got to where I've got to a platform which I've got something, especially with this office and also with the website, that is a good expression of what I do. People see other people's houses, like most of it is word of mouth through advertising. It's through people experiencing the work that we've done by seeing houses and also being comfortable working with us. There's the relationship. I mean, I've had very, very few bad relationships or jobs turn out wrong because I just don't let them. I, I made a very conscious decision that even if I've got a client that's really, really hard, it's not going to end in tears. They're paying me and I have to deliver. Unless we choose to have maybe once in 25 years, we've chosen to separate. We're a service industry. We are. Bryony, do you think you got that from your mother and your father? I got that from Dad. Dad's people skills were extraordinary. Dad was very, very charismatic and incredibly ambitious. And one thing he taught us is that if you, you can be anything that you want to be. And that is one thing I really did here when we were young. Even though I didn't finish school, I was chronically dyslexic. I don't have an academic bone in my body, but I do think I'm very emotionally intelligent. And I learned all that from Dad. And also, I think I'm, very, I'm quite good at reading people. But I mean, you were three of you, and we haven't talked about your brother, but he is also a very high profile, successful Australian business person. Three incredibly different children, but each of you have really reached the top of your world. And not effortlessly, but nothing is effortless. So also different. The interesting thing too, it's funny is, that my brother did exactly what my father did. I did exactly what my mother did. And Sky is sort of in a strange realm in between. They were both very creative, both very individual. It was the 50s and the 60s, so it was, it was much more conservative. But they were both in quite creative fields and quite at the beginning. Dad must have been extraordinary if you think about it. The first man on television, and it was like the entire change of communication. And mum was working in one of the best interior design businesses in the industry. We got exposed to all of that. You know when you don't know anything different, that's how we lived. I've always loved working. I really need a purpose. With your studio of talent downstairs, these amazing young people who work with you and who are training and trying to imbibe from you what you probably drank in from your mother. What sort of advice do you give them? Well, that's interesting. I think it takes quite a long time. It's not something that you can sit down and instill in somebody in a conversation or in a job interview or in the first year because they have no comprehension of what this process is about. I was doing a job review or performance review the other day. I said to two of them, the biggest thing that I would say to you is listen to the client because you don't listen. They start showing me things. I go, she said she didn't like that. I watch them when they come to a job. I watch them communicate with people. Like design is design. There is no bad taste and there's no good taste. It's your taste. And they've got to develop their own taste. Being in here, they are surrounded by the best textiles, the best finishes, the best tiles, the best art, the best... Everything that's out there on the market is in this office and how they choose to put it together has to be their journey. But I think the biggest thing is learning how to talk to clients, to go to their house. And I said, look at how they live because we can completely change their environment, but we have to understand how they live, how we can either improve it, but also to how they live with their children. Everybody lives very, very differently. And I think, you know, that's what you've got to tune in to them because once you tune into somebody and how they live, 
then you can start presenting how they could live. Yeah. That is hugely important to me, is like listen to your client grief, look at the house, look at how they live, look at how they dress, look at their art, look at everything. You will find something in there to hook into that is relevant to them and where they want to go, but they don't know how to get there by themselves. I think a really important thing for people to talk about when they're going through this process and something that applies to life in general is that most people don't really like talking about the money. No, they don't. Having said that, I know from my own experience with you, you are very upfront about putting a value on your time and getting that right out into the beginning of the conversation. Because I think a lot of women are inclined to say, I'm, oh, look, I'm happy to do this, you know, I'm happy to do this for you. And I was definitely found it incredibly painful to start with, incredibly painful. Jeremy, my husband, was like, if you're going to do a quote for someone and you're going to buy all that fabric, you've got to make them pay for it up front because you cannot carry the cost. And people say, I'll just order it and quote it. And you get yourself in trouble a couple of times because people, unless you give people how much it's going to cost and they pay the deposit up front, that means they've made a commitment to you. That's how I look at it, is that they've given me the money. That means we are in a contract together to work together. You've paid me, so now it's, you're committed to the process and now I have to deliver. Because then the money's been put aside. The money's done. We don't have to worry about it to yeah. start with. I used to find it very terrifying and uncomfortable. It's funny, it doesn't bother me at all. And it's very, very hard for someone to understand how much you're worth in the beginning, but they always completely understand at the end. They don't really realise how much work goes into it. No, they don't. Or how much work you put into it. I must say this is a theme that I am interested in, how you value yourself and the accumulation of talent and expertise that you represent. And I suppose what I've observed is that some men are better at this than some women who tend to say, well, I'm so grateful for the work that... I'll do it for almost nothing. And that's a big thing that women need to overcome because their work is valuable. Oh no, absolutely. I think also too, I'm always grateful for the work. It doesn't matter if it's a job that's right for me or a job that's not right for me. I am very grateful every time someone still rings that phone and wants us to work for them. But I think the greatest thing is just the experience of having done it so many times. I know what's involved. I know how long it's going to take. I know how long it's it's going to take for someone to draw it in the office to select something. You've got to run a business. You've got to pay your staff and you've got to pay a mortgage. So I did a lot of things in the beginning of my career with jobs I shouldn't have taken that weren't a good fit, that I needed the money, that I probably undersold myself because I needed money. But what's one of the luxuries of being in the position sitting here now, 20, 25 years later on, I go, I don't need to do that. And I, go, I so go on my gut. I walk into a job. I can look at someone, I can look at their house, I can start talking to them and I go, no, this is not for me. Honestly, I know every time. And early in anyone's career when you need money, it's very, very hard to be in, you're not in that position. But I'm pretty good at judging. How do you see the next five years? I want emotional balance. I want to be healthy. I want to be stimulated. I want to be fit. I want to be happy. I want to travel. I'm going to develop this building and put a third story on it. I want to pay off this building. I want to know that I'm going to have enough work that I can keep everybody working downstairs. The environment of this office is incredibly important to me. The culture in this building is really important. We all have lunch together every day. I feed everybody. It's really important. We're all close and every, quite intimate with everybody. Everyone knows what's going on in everyone's life. We're all very supportive to everybody when they've got problems. That is very important to me, the environment that they work in. That's my responsibility. It's not about chasing the great big jobs. It's much more about the culture of this place, teaching them the sharing of, of my skills and I want to be happy when I come to work every day. I want to listen to music. I want to laugh with them. I want nice clients. I want to be creative. I would be perfectly happy 
working to 75, if I can just pace it out at a really nice pace, it's not about the quantity. And not rushing, I think go, not going at a ridiculous pace. I think to survive getting older, I think pace is quite important, maybe not be quite so frenetic. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Unpaused. I'd love you to subscribe on iTunes or share the podcast with someone you think might like it. You can find the show notes or sign up for news on my website, unpaused.net, or see what we're up to on Instagram or my LinkedIn page. Bye for now.